All right. All right. Welcome to episode eight of the 49 Carats podcast. As always, we are happy to be back, happy to be chatting with fellow 49er fans about the 49ers. I'm here with my co-host, Steph Sanchez at Stragosaurus. If you don't know me already, I'm Angelina Martin at Ange Writes. And it's not just the two of us here today. We actually have a special guest, someone you all know and love very well, and we do as well. It's Jordan Elliott of Niners Nation. What's up? I am thrilled to be here. Um, it is an honor to be on one of my favorite podcasts regarding the 49ers. So thank you guys for having me today. Yeah, and we have to say a big congrats to you for your new contributing role at Niners Nation. Um, one of the best 49ers fan sites. Uh, and it's, you know, probably where a lot of us started out reading about the 49ers. So kudos to you. Um, what is what is your new role there? And how's it going so far? Um, so right now, it's just kind of uh, like base contributor role. So I'll be doing uh, uh, writing every week, I'll be doing uh, my goal is to do three to five posts a week, at least three closer to five, hopefully, um, I'll be doing some audio and visual stuff as well. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm there to do whatever they ask of me. Um, and uh, so right now, what I've been doing is I, I, I live fairly close to Santa Clara. So I've been covering training camp. So um, anybody who's interested in following what's going on there, um, I've been there for every practice but the first one. And I will be there through this week at the very least. Um, and then I also will be um, in L.A. next week for the joint practices they'll be doing with the Los Angeles Chargers as well. So, um, yeah, it's pretty like it's pretty much whatever they ask of me. But uh, as of now, it's been really fun doing training camp with all that stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, luckily for them and luckily for 49ers Twitter, you have been at training camp and you've been killing it. Uh, I'm pretty much up to speed on everything that's been happening there without being there, thanks to you. So you're killing it, man, and we love to see it. And I have to check in with my co-host, Steph. Steph, uh, how are you feeling? How is training camp going for you? And how much fun are you having now that football is back? Well, I'm a little bummed that this year I was not able to go to any of the practices. But like you said, I feel like I've been there with the great coverage that Jordan has been having. Um, pretty much been checking his Twitter religiously this whole week. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank God for him, especially when uh, you're now living in Colorado, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, as usual, we have a lot of 49ers stuff to get into. But we're going to start today's episode with this week or uh, in today's case, this day in 49ers history. And this is something that happens every year, actually. It is Dion Sanders' birthday today. Primetime, mm -hmm. primetime, primetime is turning 54 years old today. Um, August 9th is the day that we're recording this. He, as you know, played one season with the 49ers in 1994, and he helped them earn their fifth Super Bowl win. Uh, their their most recent Super Bowl win, unfortunately. Um, and if you look at his stats from that season, it's pretty amazing. He had six interceptions, three touchdowns, over 300 yards um, at cornerback. So that was a pretty great year for the 49ers. And happy birthday to primetime. He's a Leo. He is a Leo. It that makes, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Big Leo energy. Yes, big <laughs> Leo energy. Um, but yeah, happy birthday to primetime. Uh I was only one year old when he was on the 49ers, so I don't have a lot to say about him. But we do have a lot to say about 49ers news because, as usual, a lot is happening this summer. Steph, take it away. All right. So since the last time we spoke, Tim Harris and Josh Peterson were waived. Josh Peterson has since been signed by the Saints. Um, Harris, actually, since he's hurt, he did clear waivers, and he is now on the 49ers IR. Um, so good to know that no one snatched him up. That was some concern for some fans. Um, also, defensive lineman Anthony Zettel announced his retirement. That was a bit of a shocker. Um, we heard he had some great play against um, – uh, God, my mind is spacing. Um, he played good. He played good. He, was no, playing was good. Against, um, he, he absolutely destroyed Trent Williams. We can call it Trent out. Williams. Yeah, I was there. Okay. Trent, Williams, Trent Williams never gets beat, right? Like that's one thing that's phenomenal to see in person is he never gets beat. And Zatel worked him on a rep. They ran it back. He didn't do as great the second time. So I think he kind of was like, you know what? I'm going to go out on top. Like I, I, <laughs> I beat the king. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out with my head held high. Well, it's crazy because he literally just retired and was like, yeah, actually, I don't like football that much. So that was pretty crazy to read. 
so weird so weird but um i yeah i mean good luck to him in uh in retirement yeah. um and a couple signings so defensive lineman david bellamy uh cornerback cw webb and tight end joshua perkins were signed also a few players were activated from the covid list juan jennings who we're all excited to see Manuel Mosley and Jaquaski Tart, although Tart is now on the pup list. So, yeah, um, that kind of leads into our training camp talk. Um, Tart was put on that physically unable to perform list. If you don't know what pup means, <laughs> it's not a list for dogs um, with that toe injury, and he cannot play the first six weeks of the season. So, we wanted to ask Jordan um, kind of what have you seen from Tavon Wilson? And is he going to be able to step up into that role that is now empty with the absence of Tart? So Wilson has actually been, in my opinion, one of the better players during training camp. Uh, he obviously has been taking the first team reps at that starting safety spot opposite Jimmy Ward with Tart out. Um, and he looked like he belonged with that first team. Uh, the biggest thing for me with Wilson is he's a veteran. Um, I think I believe this is his not. Uh, I think it's his 11th season in the league now. It's 10th or 11th. He's been around the league for a long time. Uh, he was with uh, New England. He won a Super Bowl with them in more of a special teams role in 2014. And he was also with Detroit. Uh, but the biggest thing with him is that he just doesn't really make mistakes. Like uh, He's not necessarily um, flashing where you're just like blown away by his play, but he's also not flashing in a bad way. And to me, that's almost just as valuable. Uh, he's a guy who's going to be in the right spots. Uh, he hasn't been getting exposed in coverage. He's played really well in the box against the run. Um, and he's just he just seems like a guy who knows where he needs to be. He understands his role. And he get, like I said, he's been around the league for a long time. So I think the 49ers are in a pretty good spot uh, in regards of, you know, him filling in for Tart whenever he gets back. And you know, truthfully, I thought he was playing so well that if Tart was healthy, it might be a bit of a competition. And that's saying a lot because Jaquiski Tart is very good at what he does. Um, the biggest thing I would say too with, uh, Wilson is that he's not shying away from the competition. So one of my favorite things that I've watched during camp is they do these one-on-one -on -one drills Well, they'll run the receivers against DBs and then they'll have the running backs and the tight ends do one-on-ones against the, um, linebackers and safeties. And he and George Kittle have gone at it a few times, not in a battle, just, you know, head to head with these matchups. And, uh, I believe it was Friday, uh, or Saturday, one of the practices, uh, no, sorry, it was Friday. Uh, Wilson clamped Kittle multiple times. Like they had, I think they had three reps. He didn't catch a single one of the balls. Two of them, Wilson stuck him the whole way. Uh, and it was just phenomenal coverage. And then yesterday, which uh, was recorded on Monday, yesterday, Sunday, um, Kittle went at him and he beat him really badly on the first rep. He had him turned around the other way, um, came back the second time. Wilson held him. They actually have referees there on site for camp. So they threw a flag for what would have been defensive holding. Kittle still brought the ball down. So it's been really fun to watch Tavon Wilson and Kittle kind of engage. You can tell these guys are really feeding off each other and getting into it. Um, and he's going head to head with an all pro tight end who I believe is one of the best in the league. I think we all can objectively say Kittle's up there uh, with Dar um, Darren Waller, Travis Kelsey and those guys. So that's another thing I would just point out real quick with Wilson is that it's not just that he's looked good in you know, a practice setting. It's that he's looking really good one on one against one of the best players in the league. So I think that they're in a very good spot. Um, comparatively to where they could have been knowing that one of their starting safeties is going to be out for the first few weeks of the season. Yeah. That's one of the cool parts about uh training camp for the 49ers. As you know, a lot of these positions do feature elite players. And so when people do good in camp, they're doing well against some of the best players in the league, which, you know, not every team has uh, the benefit of, of being able to practice against some of the best. So it's really cool to hear that he's balling out against Kittle, which like you said, Definitely says something. Uh, let's talk about thing one and thing two. I know cornerback was a topic of concern for a lot of people headed into the draft. Um, so what are you seeing from Jimmy Ward and Jason Verrett? So first of all, I just have to throw this out there. The number changes, like phenomenal, like chef's kiss. Like that number two <laughs> on Jason Verrett looks so good. And I wish more defensive backs would wear that number two. Um, I would echo the same sentiment with Jimmy Ward and that number one. Um, and then – just from the play between the two, it's very evident that those two are kind of the alphas in that DB room, both in terms of how they're carrying themselves, uh, leading, and also just their play on the field. Um, Jimmy Ward is a guy that's finally getting his roses, it seems like, after years. 
of uh, being one of the more underrated players in the league. Uh, his ability to be just such a versatile weapon where he can play single high, he can sit and cover two over the top, he can come down in the slot and play man, they can blitz him, he's good against the run. Um, he's just a guy who does everything. And I think it's really nice to see that he's finally getting that recognition. And then with Jason Verrett, uh, the biggest thing for me is that he's been carrying himself like a guy who has that kind of swagger of a DB1, uh, where he's kind of, you know, um, it's not a cockiness, but it's an air of confidence that's really good to see. And you really do want to see that out of a player who's going to be your number one option in that cornerback room. Uh, the, one of the other really fun battles of camp has been watching him and Brandon Ayuk because Brandon Ayuk has been having a phenomenal camp. He's been torching everybody but Jason Verrett. When they those two go head to head, Verrett has definitely gotten the better of him, in my opinion. And it's another situation, like Angie just mentioned, where you have some of these elite players, and it's that you know old cliche like iron sharpening iron. So uh, Verrett's looked phenomenal, and he's just been a guy that uh, clearly looks like he's um, rebounded from that kind of stretch of injuries he had over a few a course the course of a few years in between his Pro Bowl season with the Chargers and his kind of resurgence that he had with the Niners last year. So I think the 49ers are in a spot where they know at least half of that secondary is going to be playing at a very elite level. And in turn, it is helping, um, I don't say hide the deficiencies because it's not like there's glaring holes in the secondary, but it's definitely helped pick up uh, other players that may even just be playing at like a baseline average level. Yeah, and you said, oh, sorry, go ahead, Steph. No, I I was just going to ask, like, do you have any concerns about the cornerback depth? Because... We know, obviously, with Verrett, there's nothing to worry about. Eman, we know he can play well. Um, but after that, like, the depth just kind of falls off a cliff in terms of quality. Um, I know we got Ambry Thomas and Lenore, but, you know, how are they doing? And are you worried about the depth at all? So they're rookies, so I'll preface what I'm going to say with the fact that they are rookies and, they, you know, it takes time to adjust, uh, particularly in Ambry Thomas's case because he didn't play during the 2020 season. He opted out. So he hasn't really had live action um, in – it's been almost two years for him. So he has not – he has not looked great to start camp. But there's no other way I could really put it. Uh, he was getting beat a lot. And, um, you know, again, it's the first week of training camp, so I wouldn't read too much into it. But Lenore looked significantly better than he did up until Saturday's practice, and it kind of switched a little bit. Um, I thought Lenore got beat repeatedly at that open practice they did at Levi Stadium for Dwight Clark Day, whereas Thomas kind of rebounded and had a little bit better of a day. But I think in their case, those are both guys that you're really hoping don't need to start right anytime soon, and you won't have to rely on them because they're guys who provide uh, good good depth for now, like if it's like, you know, a break in case of emergency situation. But I think that their role on like a special as like a special teamer this year would be much more beneficial for them and the team. Whereas maybe next season, uh, like Lenore specifically, I think might take over for Kwan Williams in that slot corner role. Should Kwan um, play the way he's been playing for the last few seasons and maybe secure uh, a little bit more of a lucrative deal elsewhere, given the fact that the Niners are going to have a little bit of a uh, more difficult time resigning guys due to the cap situation next season. Um, and then I think with Thomas, the thing is too, is that he really excels in press man. And I think that with D'Amico Ryans, they're going to be running a lot more man coverage. And based on what we've seen at training camp, they are running more man coverage. So I think with him, it's more a situation of just getting accustomed to, uh, one being able to, um, react to defending NFL wide receivers, which is, as we know, there's a huge gap between defending at the college level and the NFL level. And then two, just kind of understanding his um, assignments and zone coverage and getting more uh, familiar and comfortable doing that. So those two guys, I think it's just a matter of uh, development. Uh, If it continues throughout the season and into next year's training camp, then I think that it would be time to start panicking. But it's a little early to, you know, start throwing out, you know, like, oh, are these guys a bust? Is this going to be, you know, is this going to be a huge issue? The bigger problem, in my opinion, is the veterans on the roster. Um, Emmanuel Mosley missed the first week of camp. He was on the COVID list. So they had a revolving door of Tim Harris was getting the, the initial first team reps. Uh, Ken Webster was getting a few. And then Dante Johnson, who seems like he's been on the 49ers forever, was also getting looks there. Um, out of those three, um, I thought that Webster had the best showing. He looked like he, he was more comfortable than the other two. But even then, uh, he still was getting beat fairly regularly. Uh, so the first day, I believe, Mosley returned was Friday. And the first play, he had a uh, target thrown at him. In 11 on 11s, he broke up a pass that was intended for Debo Samuel on a little uh, eight to ten yard out route on the right sideline, and he like immediately it it felt much more comfortable 
um, with that secondary where it didn't feel like it was going to be, you know, Ferret and Ward and Wilson holding their own and then whoever was in that fourth spot getting exposed. So I think the return of Mosley has really um, solidified that starting unit. So I don't have any concerns regarding like that uh, initial grouping or that nickel grouping when they're going to throw K1 out there as well. But if one of those guys gets hurt, um, I, I would be lying if I said I wouldn't be a little concerned after what I saw from, uh, I think Webster will be the one who ultimately makes the team out of those veterans, but we'll see how it plays out. So yeah, I think they're in a position where it really is just kind of like the veteran depth. That's a concern because the rookies in their defense shouldn't be in a position where they do, they think they should be expected to go out there and contribute right away. So I wonder if that's something they will address. They did bring in um, Webb, as you mentioned, and he's looked pretty good in my opinion. He's had a couple balls thrown out of an 11 on 11s, and I thought he's more than hold, uh, held his own. And I don't think that he's been a liability in coverage. It'll be interesting to see if maybe he continues to kind of slowly rise up that depth chart and make the team. But yeah, I, I wouldn't feel great about the corner depth if uh, one of those starters gets hurt. Yeah, and we know after last season that injuries happen, you know, and they seem to happen all too frequently to the 49ers. So uh, knock on wood that they all stay safe out there and we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, but moving on, um, we want to talk about Talanoa Ufanga. Where are you seeing him used out at camp um, and what it, what are your thoughts on him so far? So the first thing I will say that stands out about Hufanga was that is that every day at practice, he's one of the first out on the field. Practice officially starts at 1017 every day as it's been, you know, kind of joked around on Twitter like Kyle's like, you know, we're starting right at 1017 every day. But these guys come out there a good, you know, 15, 20 minutes early. They'll start stretching. They'll do individual drills. Hufanga has consistently been getting out there at about uh, 925, 930 uh, well over 45 minutes before practice begins. And he's doing all kinds of drills, working in coverage, um, working on his conditioning. And it's, a, it's just a situation where it seems like he's very hungry for this opportunity that he's been given. And, you know, you'd like to think that, you know, if every player that works super hard like that, uh, if that translated, they'd all be really good. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time. But the fact that he's displaying that willingness to work on his craft and put that extra effort in, I think really stood out to me right away. And he's also staying after practice, I'd add as well. He's another one of those guys who every day you see when the players go in after practice ends, continues to get work in with the DB coaches, uh, continues to sit there and work. If the, if the receivers are running routes, he'll go out there and cover. Um, so I think that actually did translate very well because he's been used in a primarily with that second team defense for the most part. Um, he's a guy, if you watch his college tape, he was really good within the box, really good against the run. Uh, wasn't particularly a plus defender in coverage, but I think he's looked a lot better. And that's something that he's really been working on when you do watch these individual workouts that he's doing before and after practice. So yesterday, uh, Sunday, they had a bit of a lighter practice. They gave a few guys maintenance days. And it was very interesting because they had uh, Jimmy Ward take a veteran day and Hufanga took his reps with the first team. So he was out there going up against the first team offense, running with the first team defense. And I thought he looked great. He looked like he belonged. He really understood his gap assignments. He, he blew up a few running plays, getting to the hole fast, showed great burst uh, and recognition. And a couple times they had him in single high coverage. And he didn't get beat. Um, I think the only play really, I would have to go back and watch. It's tough when we're watching from the side view. Uh, there was that one play that got, you know, kind of circulated where they hit Debo. Uh, Jimmy threw a ball to Debo deep down the sideline. Um, and it looked again like it was a Hufanga in single high. So I wouldn't put that on him getting beat per se. But that was the only real play that was, um, that I noticed that was in his vicinity where he might have had some sort of culpability there. But the fact that they trusted him to be sitting in these single high looks with that first team offense running kind of speaks to how they've, um, uh, you know, appreciated his development over time during camp. So he's a guy who's slowly risen. And I think, again, it's one of those cliche things where you hear first in, last out. But he's been doing it every day. And I don't think there's any coincidence that he um, – or it's not an accident that he's slowly rising up the depth chart as he's putting in all that work as well. So he's a guy I felt pretty confident about making the team. I would be completely shocked if he was cut at any point during this preseason. Yeah, I saw you refer to him on Twitter as a chess piece. Yes, yeah, so yeah. they're they're willing to move him around the box quite a bit, which has been really cool. So they also had a play, um, blanking on who the other DB was. I'm trying to remember if it was a day where Ward and Wilson were out there. They had Hufanga in the box, so it was almost like their base 4-3 look, which is four down linemen, three linebackers. But they had Hufanga playing at Will linebacker to the left of Fred Warner. So they almost utilized him like a linebacker. And it's very interesting because they've had Marcel Harris running with the linebackers as well. 
So they seem very keen on kind of uh, having one of those guys who was a safety who's good within the box also play a role similar to more similar to a traditional linebacker in a base set. And I think it just gives them tremendous flexibility because a player like Hufanga can defend the run the way he can. And he also has the ability to cover. It really adds an, uh, another added element to that defense where it's going to be really hard for these tight ends and running backs to consistently torch a guy who has that speed and burst that Hufanga mm-hmm. does. Yeah, we had um, Ryan Roberts on our post-draft episode, and he had nothing but good things to say about Hufanga and also like his work ethic. So, you know, it, it's great to know that that's translating onto the field and, and you know, how the team trusts him. Um, yeah. But, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, yeah, I'm glad also that you touched on Marcel Harris um, being at linebacker. So you think he's doing well there? I think that he is another guy who's putting in the work every day after practice. He's stayed and worked. Uh, he's worked a couple times with James Betcher, the new special assistant, uh, special defensive assistant, who um, has uh, uh, he has a great um, reputation for a guy who's really good at dialing up exotic blitzes and a few different uh, exotic fronts. So I think working with him specifically has been really helpful because if they do decide to use Harris in that box role, should he make the team, I think getting that extra work, um, I think he's been hitting the sled, um, working on pass rushing drills as well as the stuff he's doing with the linebackers during practice uh, in general. So he's a guy I think ultimately where the Niners looked at him, and I think Marcel Harris has always been a good player within the box. He's been good against the run. Uh, He's been beat a lot in coverage though, and I think the Niners looked at him and they're like, you know what, like we have a fairly deep safety room. We need to uh, – we really like this player, but we need to find a way to maximize his strength. So I think it's almost a situation where they're kind of giving him one last shot at uh, you know, sticking on the team and making the roster and maybe a new hybrid role. Uh, so I think that he's working very hard at it. He has been beat a little bit. Again, he still has the same issues sometimes in coverage, uh, especially with some of these uh, quicker, um, shiftier um, slot receivers. And a couple, of the, a couple of the tight ends on the team can really move really well too. So he has had some issues with that. But it's not for lack of effort. He is putting in the work uh, before and after practice as well. And he's another guy, like I said, I've noticed almost every day after practice, he's staying and getting that extra work in. I just think it's a situation where um, there's a few guys that, you know, I'm sure we'll get to talking about the defense. The defense is so loaded and there are so many good players out there because they're at 90 guys right now. I think 91 with Alfredo Gutierrez added is like a special exemption and they have to cut down to 53 eventually. And there are a lot of guys who uh, you could make the case belong on an NFL roster who are going to be cut simply because there are just so many good players in front of them. And I unfortunately think that's going to be the situation with Harris. There are so many good linebackers on this team. And if they are going to use a converted safety hybrid linebacker safety role or however you want to word it, I think Hufanga has the edge over him, especially when you consider the fact that he's going to be on that cost controlled rookie deal for the next couple seasons as well. Yeah. What have you seen um, in that battle for Will Linebacker? I know you mentioned Hufanga got some reps there. We have Al Sher versus Flanagan Foles versus Jonas Griffith. I'm sure those are some of the names you were thinking of, but what have you seen from that competition and, and who who do you think has stood out? So Al Shair was one of the best players in training camp, in my opinion, before he, he ended up getting hurt. I think it was like a minor meniscus injury. And the good news actually I saw yesterday, they were reporting that he will be back probably before the regular season. So that's great news to hear because, again, he he just looked like a guy that belonged with that first team. Uh, one thing about the 49ers uh, starting linebacker unit and just the depth as a whole for the most part, uh, but particularly between Greenlaw, Warner, and um, Al Shair, is they have such good sideline to sideline speed. Like these guys are so fast, and um, I think it's a um, testament to the 49ers' commitment to kind of adapt to this modern NFL where you are going to have to leave these linebackers in space. Uh, You're going to have to play sideline to sideline a lot. Teams are going to try to stretch you out uh, vertically as much as they are horizontally. So Al Shair was in firm control of that starting spot before he got hurt. So I'd have a hard time seeing him um, seed it should he, you know, have no uh, setbacks with that injury coming back. Um, Flanagan Fowles is another guy who I'm a big fan of. I think he will kind of reprise that role he had as the fourth linebacker, as a guy who will contribute on special teams. Another guy who is a converted safety who has just tremendous speed, uh, pretty good instincts. I just think it's, again, it's a case where Al Shire just looked a little bit better. And then Jonas Griffith is an interesting guy because I, I, um, I think that they will end up carrying five linebackers because of him. He has just, throughout the course of this camp, looked better and better each day. Uh, he was in camp last year. He spent the majority of last season on the uh, practice squad. 
And he's a guy that just looks like he's in much better shape. He came, he wasn't in bad shape last week. He came in with an even better shape this year. Uh, he has great instincts. He has really good feet. He moves laterally, uh, laterally really well. And he just looks like a guy that um, is kind of forcing his way into, into being a roster lock with his play. It's, it's, it's a situation where the Niners are going to have to make some tough cuts and he's probably going to um, uh, be spared for any of those cuts just because of how he's played. Uh, he had infamously, he had the first or fa- famously, however, whichever side you may fall on, he had the first interception of Trey Lance during camp. Uh, he's looked really uh, good the last couple of days running with the ones. He got reps with the ones when Flanagan Fowles was still out there. And then I believe Flanagan Fowles had some sort of minor um, thing they were being cautionary about because he wasn't out there for practice yesterday. So Griffith did take his reps then. And he just looks like a guy who belongs. And if you have those five, they all um, – kind of play a similar style and have similar uh, physical traits, some obviously better than others. We all know Fred Warner's one of the best linebackers in football. But you're in a situation where, you know, should one of them get hurt? Like, that was one thing that we saw when um, Al Shayer went down. Flanagan Fowles was able to step in, and you know, even though Al Shayer had been playing better, you didn't replace him with, like, you know, a big lumbering linebacker that doesn't fit the scheme they're running. He came in and he was able to do a lot of the same things. So the drop off won't be as significant. So I think those will ultimately be the five that make the roster. There's a couple other guys who flashed here and there, but I just think those five are so good. They've kind of solidified their spot. Yeah. Anything you wanted to add about linebackers stuff? I was, I was just going to say, it'll be interesting how many they actually keep. I mean, you, you said Griffin has made, made the case for being on the team. I wonder if they'll, try to hide one of those players during um, the preseason we might not see one of them as much and that might be a hint as to who they might want to keep either on the practice squad or on the roster so yeah we'll see yeah hashtag depth man (laughs) but uh, we can't talk about defense without talking about the pass rush and as we know the 49ers are hoping to see two players bounce back from injuries this season. Um, that would be Nick Bosa and D Ford. Um, what have you seen from them returning from these injuries? Is there anything that they haven't participated in or have participated in that, that has you worried or has you excited or, you know, what's just, what have you seen at camp? So I'll get the, like, like the, it's not really a worry, but I'll get that, you know, out of the way first. Nick Bosa hasn't participated in 11 on 11s yet. And I think that's intentional. I don't think he's had any setback. I just think the Niners know, um, you know, as much as it's nice to get those reps in, he's really good at what he does. He doesn't really need, you know, there's not much to be gained and there certainly is a lot to be lost should he go down in 11 on 11s. So they've kept him off to the side working on his own, but he seems to be moving very well. Uh, There's nothing that I've seen where he looks hampered. Uh, He still is participating in uh, the individual drills with the defensive linemen. He still is, um, you know, hitting the um, sleds. He still is working with Chris Kosarek and doing the, all the things that they're doing up until the team portions of the drills. So I think that's just, again, it's just a precautionary thing. Kyle Shanahan said yesterday or the day before, I believe, that he's still on track to start week one. I just think they know that it's he's too valuable for that defense and the team as a whole to risk going down and with a training camp situation uh, during 11s. So he probably won't see the field. And he, I would be shocked if they had him out there during the preseason at all either. So um, that's something that 49ers fans shouldn't panic about. It's just them being very, very cautious with not only one of the best players on the team, but one of the best players in the league. So I totally Honestly, understand that. If he's out there in preseason, I'll be pissed. <laughs> and I wouldn't fault you at all. Yeah, I wouldn't fault you at all. <laughs> it, would, it just makes no sense. There's no reason to do it. Um, so I think that, you know, he can get those kind of, you know, quick reps in the week leading up to week one when they're doing practice and game prep. I'm sure they will be in team drills for that. But, um, yeah, so that's something, that, again, I wouldn't worry about too much. And then with D Ford, He's been one of the revelations of training camp. He had uh, a little bit more limited days the first couple days I was there. Uh, he wasn't participating in 11-on-11s. He was working off to the side doing some things. But then they threw him out in 11-on-11s uh, before they had pads. And then during the first couple padded practices, he was out there as well. Uh, when he's going up, when, you know, when you're not having anybody block in front of you and you're just doing defensive line drills, it's kind of easy to have that you know explosion and speed pop. But when he was actually out there taking live reps against the first team defense, he had a few reps where he just looked like his old 2019 self. And I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to remind people, be cautious with your optimism because uh, some of the injuries he suffered, a lot of players would never be on a football field again after. So uh, it's not fair to expect that he's just going to come back and be that 2019 D Ford we saw and how much value he added to that already really good defensive line. 
but there certainly is a range of outcomes where he's very close to that. And I think that that's a far more realistic possibility than him just going out there and being just an average player. He looks like he's regained some of that, um, not average, sorry, some of that explosive uh, burst because that's really what sets Steve Ford apart as a speed rusher is a guy that they can put in the nine technique, which is essentially way wide outside of the tackles. Um, and you basically are just beating that tackle to the edge. And he has that speed and explosion to get around those tackles. Um, him and McGlinchey had a couple really good battles going back and forth, but he still is like winning on uh, more than just speed. He won a couple bull rushing reps. He won a couple where he faked to the outside and cut back in. So if they get a healthy D Ford as a guy who can come in and be a rotational pass rusher and be a guy that they're going to use strictly in situations where, you know, it's third and eight or a team's, you know, the, it's a two minute drill and they're not going to be running the ball. I think they'll be in great shape because they have such good depth on that defensive line at the edge and on the interior, especially that they're not going to rely on him to be this guy who has to play, um, you know, every third down in a game or be out there on base downs. So um, I'm very excited to see how they end up deploying him because he looks like a guy that's um, cleared those hurdles for his injury. He didn't participate in 11 on 11s the last two days, but I think, again, it's just a situation where they're being extremely cautious with him. And uh, he hasn't been, he, uh, the other thing I would point out too, is while he wasn't out there with his teammates during 11s, uh, with the players who were on the sideline, the way he was moving around, big smile on his face, moving around, didn't have a limp, didn't have anything where he was, you know, grabbing his back or looked like he had uh, any kind of uh, thing limiting his movement. And I think that body language goes a long way because he looked like he was out there having a lot of fun. And that's one thing I can imagine for a player who's had the amount of injuries he's had the last couple of seasons. It really does take its toll on you. So the fact that he's out there kind of displaying that joy and moving around freely the way he is, I think bodes really well for his chances to be an impact player this year. Yeah, I'm sure he's just happy to be out there, man. You know, we weren't even sure if we would see him on the 49ers this year. So that's super exciting to hear. Um, I heard him at the podium um, talking to the media and they asked if he ever had considered retirement. And he was like, no, this is my life. Um, and he also said that he thinks that his best years of football are still ahead of him. So if you know what he's done in the past, that's exciting to hear. And if that's true, then uh, the NFL should watch out. Yeah. Um, Steph, I know you wrote an awesome article for 49ers Goldmine about the IDL. And I know you have some questions for Jordan about those players. So uh, I'll let you throw them at him right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we know about the new additions to the interior depth. Um, so what have you seen from players like Zach Kerr and Maurice Hurst? Like, how have they been looking rushing from the interior? First of all, I just think it was organizational malpractice for the Raiders to let that man walk out. Of, and speaking <laughs> about Maurice Hurst, to let him walk out of that building for nothing. Um, he has been just incredible. He's a guy, because the depth has been so good on that first team, he's a guy that ended up just being um, kind of relegated to the second uh, unit just because of the players in front of him. But he was absolutely just demolishing the second and third team offensive line over and over and over again. Um, Zach Kerr kind of in the same boat because generally the first team reps have gone to DJ Jones and Javon Kinlaw. And then during the uh, turbo sets where they're pushing the passer, Eric Armstead is kicked inside. He's been next to uh, Javon Kinlaw for the most part. So with those guys, when you're looking at uh, Zach Kerr, um, Maurice Hurst, uh, Kevin Givens, um, uh, sorry, uh, Katavia Street, sorry, uh, and a few of these guys on the interior – their second unit could be a starting unit for a large portion of teams in the NFL. And the fact that these guys are out there just um, working in unison and being able to be rotated the way they have been really bodes well for the 49ers because we saw at the end of that 2019 season where the defensive line was far and away the strongest unit on the entire team, they slowly started losing players and the depth wasn't um, – the depth players weren't – you know. They weren't at a level close enough to the starters. Obviously, they're not going to be as good as the starters. That's why the starters are starters and depth players are depth players. But the gap was significant. What I'm seeing this year is the drop-off from the first unit to the second unit to the third unit is much closer. And I think that that bodes very well for them because they're going to be able to keep guys fresh during the season. And they're going to be able to work diff all different kinds of stunts, different kinds of personnel groupings. And ultimately, should a guy go down, it's going to happen, unfortunately, every year in the trenches with the way those guys are playing there. 
Um, they have guys that can step in and there won't be the significant drop off that we've seen in recent seasons when those defensive linemen get hurt. So in my opinion, um, the interior defensive line, if you're, if you're looking at like specific position groupings and specific parts of a position group, that interior defensive line is by far the best unit on the team. And it's just ridiculous when you look at the amount of talent that they've amassed on there. Um, real quick, I'd add to um, – I thought that Javon Kinlaw had his best practice of the season yesterday. It was without pads. So you have to add the caveat that it's always going to be an advantage for the defensive linemen. Offensive linemen don't have anything to grab when they're blocking, when you're not in pads. So it is a little bit uh, of something that you might you have to add that nuance for. But he looked great, and that's really good to see because one of the 49ers' better signings this offseason was getting center Alex Mack. And there was a few reps during the first couple padded practices with those two going at it where Mac just clearly displayed his veteran savvy and his um, tremendous football IQ because Javon Kinlaw is six foot five, three thirty five, And Mac was beating him in reps where um, he backs a big man himself. I'm not downplaying his size either, but you could tell it was more of a mental thing. And I think that that's something that Javon Kinlaw specifically is going to benefit from getting those reps against the guy on the, on the interior offensive line. Who's been um, a Pro Bowl level player? Who's been around the league for over a decade? Who's really going to help him refine his skills um, and help him get better? Because uh, one thing that was uh, you know kind of noted about Kinlaw coming out was that he beat so many guys in college just based on his size and physical ability that he didn't have to rely on you know a bag of pass rushing moves or um, a little bit more uh, of an intricate attack when he was um, attacking that offensive line. And I think that that's something that he's uh, slowly throughout this camp really progressed with. And I'm very excited to see because I think that people gave up on Javon Kinlaw way too soon. He got way, way too much negativity last year. When I thought he had a fine rookie season, um, particularly when you're given, you know, the injuries the defense had um, and the guys that he lost around him on the D-line. So I'm really, really excited to see the jump that he takes because while the depth is really good, that starting unit of him and DJ Jones, and DJ Jones really quickly too, is a guy that is so good and flies under the radar, it seems like, every year. He has tremendous lateral ability and his just kind of, um, I, I, I want to say like shake, like his ability to shake offensive linemen and move side to side is insane. And he's um, he's not as tall as the other linemen, but he's very wide, very stout. So having those two eat up the interior and allowing guys like Arden Key and Nick Bosa and D Ford and these edge players to eat on the outside and have them go one-on-one uh, with guys on the edge. It's just, I, I'm really excited. I'm trying to temper my expectations, but I think that this unit can get very close to the level that they were at in 2019. Yeah. I will say Ken law was my pick for the dark horse of the season. He's going to have a, a breakout year this season, hopefully. And I would also like to add, that um, organizational malpractice and uh, Las Vegas Raiders are synonymous. So <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> um, and I know you you touched on it a little bit, but you know it sounds like Kinlaw looks good returning from injury. He's out there practicing. Um, nothing of concern. Seems like he's going to ball out. Yeah, I just think that he's a guy that he has all the physical gifts in the world. And you just like you can you can learn the intricacies of playing defensive line. You can learn new pass rushing moves. You can learn, uh, you know, uh, how, how to attack a run gap differently. You can turn you can learn how to um, do a lot of these things that these guys are going to be asked to do. You cannot teach a human being to be six foot five and 330 pounds <laughs> like that's something that you, it's just it's a natural gift. So I'm more than willing to be patient to see how he's going to develop. And I think it was, uh, you know, a little bit of an unfair situation for him because, uh, you know, obviously before his Buckner was a beloved 49er, he was a tremendous player. You could argue he's the best interior defensive lineman after Aaron Donald in the league. And I understand that people were upset, but it was very unrealistic for people to expect a rookie of any caliber to come in and replace DeForest Buckner, let alone a guy that has totally different set of skills and is going to do a lot of things differently. Um, and I would add real quick, you know, Buckner was a, a tremendous pass rusher, and he, coming out of Oregon, he was a, he had a great uh, bag of moves that he could go to. Uh, but he also was a guy that was a bit more on the finesse side, and there were times where he would get beat when guys would run, uh, when other teams would run at him, um, and they would they would kind of attack him up the middle with a lot of rushing plays. The 49ers jumped from they were 17th in rushing defense in 2019, and they went up to seventh in 2020. And I think a lot of that had to do with the play of Kinlaw in the middle and his ability to eat multiple um, linemen and take on multiple blocks 
and allow the linebackers behind him and the players playing in the box behind him to then fill those gaps and uh, slow down the rushing attacks of other teams. So while he may not be the guy that's out there getting 10, 11 sacks and, you know, uh, forcing fumbles and doing all these things Buckner did, he did have a significant uh, uh, contribution to the Niners going from a bottom half of the league rushing defense to a top 10 unit. Yeah. And one thing I always think of is like, and that I feel like fans forget is that Buckner wasn't even the Buckner we know him as now in his rookie season. So yes, I I totally agree that people should give Kinlaw a chance. Obviously he's not going anywhere. DJ Jones isn't going anywhere. If you had to pick an odd man out for the interior defensive line, who would you say? I would say, right, so I've been going over this a lot, and it's tough because they the history showed they'll carry 10. Um, I, I just think as of now, it's Contavious Street, and I think that he has had a really good camp. It's nothing against him personally, but I just think that the interior, like Givens, they really like. I know that I know the team is a big fan of him, and he's, had, he's looked really good during camp. Hurst has looked really good. Jones and Kinlaw are locks, um, and it's just – I, I think that he ends up being the odd man out just based on the play of those around him. And I think that he will get picked up very quickly should he get cut because he's a good football player. It's just a situation where they're so deep at that position that I don't see him beating out like a Zach Kerr um, and some of these other guys that will be fringe roster players with him as well. And I think that what it comes down to is that uh, while Street has had some injuries, I know the Niners really liked him coming out. That's why they drafted him, obviously. Um, Zach Kerr was one of the better players on uh, Carolina's defense last year. So he has proven tape and proven um, equity at the NFL level that we just haven't seen from street yet to this point. And that doesn't mean you, he can't do it. I would just feel much more comfortable taking the proven commodity rather than the projection of, Oh, I think this guy could be really good. So I think ultimately um, those five will beat him out because I think they'll end up rostering five edge players as well just because of the concern around D Ford and Bosa and some of these guys, they're going to need a little bit more depth there as well. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but I just, I think that that's going to be the, the hardest day of roster cuts or the hardest portion of roster cuts. I should say is when they start trimming down that defensive line, because I think there are 13 guys, maybe even 14 that belong on NFL rosters that, and they're, they're only going to end up keeping 10 of them. So there's going to be a few guys, unfortunately, who won't make the team who, uh, I don't want to say they deserve to because it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, if they deserve to, they'd make the team, but it's just unfortunate that they ended up in such a log jam of talented players. Yeah. I mean, it's never a bad thing for the 49ers when they have a crap ton of really good players to choose from. So, but we do have to rewind because there were a couple uh pass rushing questions that I skipped over that we had for you. And we want to, take advantage of your knowledge as much as possible during this hour. Uh, what's going on with Eric Armstead? He's missed a couple of practices. Do you know? So as far as I was told, it was groin tightness. And he actually yesterday was off to the side working. Um, Samson Ebukam has missed a couple uh, practices as well. Uh, he had a minor leg swelling that was described by uh, the coaching staff as just general wear and tear from camp. And I think the Niners, again, they're in a position with some of these veteran guys. They know what they need to do. Um, they're not, you know, uh, I'm not downplaying the significance of learning the intricacies of defensive line play, but they also, it's a little different than learning, you know, coverages or learning routes. Like, you know, they they can, they can afford to take a day off or two here or there. Uh, and they're not going to be, you know, left behind in terms of, you know, keeping up with the rest of the unit for what they're planning for the season. So I think with the defensive line and, um, they're able to kind of be a little bit more cautious with these guys. So Armstead was out moving freely. Uh, he looked good in camp during the 11s. He, he hasn't, you know, been out for long. I think it's been three practices that he's missed. Uh, and it's just, again, it's just general um, precautionary stuff there. Same thing with Ebukam. I would be surprised if they weren't participating in the padded practices that will be happening Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week, just because they're getting ready for the first preseason game. Uh, I, it's like, like I said, as far as I know, it wasn't anything that was – so bad that we should be concerned and they wouldn't have been out on the field working out the way they were. If it was an injury that really was bad, they would be off their feet somewhere rehabbing. Yeah. Especially after last season, like just based on your knowledge of training camp, does it seem like the 49ers are being um, a lot more cautious in giving guys time off and making sure that they don't push themselves too hard um, to where it is going to result in like a season ending injury? 
I think last year uh, definitely changed the way they're approaching a lot of this. I think that they are being much more cautious with how they're scheduling things. So, like, they had uh, padded practice on Friday. They had the Dwight Clark Day at uh, Levi's on Saturday, which is another padded practice. And then they ramped down. They did the practice without pad Sunday. They have the day off today. Um, so I think they're doing a much more – they're being much more meticulous with how they're planning out their weeks for practice. And they're having the uh, players, regardless of position, on a little bit more of a, like a – like a cautionary schedule with how they're deploying right. them for these practices. So I definitely think that that's something that they're more cognizant of. And I think especially with guys like, you know, um, Ebu Kham should have a significant role in the team. Armstead, we already know, uh, is a significant contributor to the team. So guys like that, they're going to be a lot more cautious with, I think, as well. Uh, and again, like they're not really missing anything on a non-padded walkthrough. So I think that um, – it's it's like it's just like you were saying you'd be pissed if you saw Nick Bosa in the preseason. I would be livid if they forced a guy with you know leg swelling to go out there just for the sake of being out there, and he ended up getting uh, you know getting a significant injury instead of um, having a you know minor leg swelling that turns into a serious thing where he's actually missing time during the regular season. Then you're looking at okay, what like what, what the hell are you guys doing? This is yeah. totally unnecessary. So I think they're doing a good job. Well, I'm sure people want to see them out there and they want to hear that every player is practicing and healthy all the time. That's just not how football is. These guys, most of those players out there are hurt. Like I was saying, there's a difference between injured and hurt. Injured, generally, you're not playing. Um, if you're hurt, most of these guys are hurt every time they're out there. It's just the it's the you know just nature of the beast hurt. playing football. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that you know I'd much rather them uh, you know be careful and play it safe than risk these guys getting hurt in a meaningless training camp practice in August. Yeah, more hurt than they already are. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell us about the pass rushing units and who you think or who we can expect to see on each one? So, obviously, Nick Bosa is going to be the leader of that unit uh, when he comes back, and it appears by all means he's going to be back and ready to go week one. Uh, he's still a superstar, uh, one of the best edge rushers in the league. Um, he's going to be starting opposite on base downs. Um, Eric Armstead will be on the other side. Uh, what that does is that gives the 49ers tremendous flexibility. Generally, early downs, you're going to see a lot more rushing plays. So between those two, they're, they have a very good versatility between them to rush the passer and also um, hold their own against the run. Uh, then you're going to start to see a little bit of, I believe, Samson Ebukam, uh in that first unit as well as they're kind of balancing out Nick Bosa's return. I don't think he's going to play nearly as much as he did on base downs in 2019. Um, and then you're going to get into the more turbo sets, the pass rushing sets, uh, where you're going to probably see uh, a starting unit of Bosa. And I would imagine Ebukam as of now, but D Ford, if he keeps playing the way he's playing, he might creep into that. But you're going to start to see kind of a revolving door. It's not going to be set in stone. So in 2019, it was pretty much on passing downs. It was going to be D Ford, Nick Bosa, Eric Armstead, and DeForest Buckner. I think this year you're going to see a lot more mixing and matching. So you're going to see um, Arden Key, who I believe is going to make the team as well. He's looked really good. Um, another guy that's really interesting because he's suspended, I think, for the first six games, if I recall correctly, and Jordan Willis. Um, he's getting a lot of reps with the first team, and he actually has been, he's been the guy consistently beating Trent Williams more than anybody else. And if you beat Trent Williams even once, you should feel really good about your day in practice. Um, and I know I, I really liked the Willis pickup last year because he's a guy that just he's – he's a phenomenal athlete. Um, he may not have a complete game, but if you just ask him to get to the quarterback and rush the passer, I think that he's a guy that will contribute a significant role. So it'll be interesting to see how they kind of use that roster spot that he would be occupying up until he comes back from the suspension. So I think that you're going to see a basically a rotation of Ebukam, Ford, Bosa, Key, and um, Willis, ultimately, which is why I think they'll only keep five interior linemen as well. I think they'll have five at each spot. Um and you'll, you'll see Armstead again playing on the edge on base downs. I don't think he'll be out there quite as much on uh, pass rushing downs. That's usually when they'll kick him inside. But another thing to watch that they've been doing is they've been doing a lot of different exotic looks um, from these pass rushing um, units. Like they've been having a lot of guys standing up in spots they normally won't. They've been moving the players all over the defensive line. They've been running some things where they have two edge players on the same side of the line. So I think that D'Amico Ryans is going to be far more creative with how he deploys his pass rushing unit um, than we saw with Sala. With Sala, a lot of it was just basically, hey, we have four guys that are damn good and we know that they're going to beat you and we might sprinkle in a stunt here and there, but we're essentially going to run almost the same thing every time and just dare you to beat us. And for the most part in 2019, they other offensive lines couldn't do it. 
I think this year you'll see from Ryan's, while he, they still have a very talented unit, he's going to be much more creative with how he's deploying that unit of pass rushers and interior linemen. That's really <laughs> funny that you said that because I don't know if you want to tell him stuff. <laughs> yeah, like our minds right now are just like we are in sync because we were actually going to ask you about some new wrinkles that you're seeing from D'Amico Ryans. I mean, we've heard that he might want to do a little bit of more blitzing. And, you know, you also mentioned that he's having Harris work as a linebacker, Hufunga as well. So, like, what new wrinkles are you seeing um, that, you know, they're trying out during training camp? So I don't want to get too much into specifics for the sake of not upsetting the, the team and the PR department themselves. But yeah, um, we don't want a, I, a call to 49 K pod. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, it's exactly what I would want to avoid as well. So I will say the, the, the looks are far more exotic. Um, they're doing a lot of things where if you are an offensive uh, opposing offensive lineman, so anybody who's familiar with DSF Niners, Brad Graham is the man who runs that site. He played uh, offensive line in college very brilliant football mind, but particularly when it comes to offensive line stuff. And he's accompanied me to the majority of these practices. So as we're sitting there in the stands, watching him do some of these walkthroughs, I'm, you know, picking his brain a little bit. And he's like, dude, as an offensive lineman, this would be terrifying because they're running a lot of different looks where you have a lot of guys near the line of scrimmage. You're seeing uh, Fred Warner, uh, Jimmy Ward, Flanagan Fowles, uh, Greenlaw, a lot of these guys close to the line of scrimmage and they're bringing numbers up, crowding the offensive line. And then you have situations where uh, a player might drop into coverage that you would assume in a given, you know, traditional um, look like that would be rushing the pass or and vice versa. So I think that they're just doing a really good job of keeping, uh, they, they will be doing a really good job, I should say, because it's still training camp, of keeping off opposing offensive lines honest and not letting them get comfortable. Because when they see a given look, they might have five different ways they're going to attack that offensive line out of that set. And it's just, it's, it's a lot, again, like the exotic is the word I would use because a lot of these reps that they're getting in through walkthroughs, it's stuff that I haven't seen at all from the 49ers defense in the last few years. And uh, as much as I love Kyle Shanahan and as much as I'm really excited to see uh, what he's going to do, particularly with a guy like Trey Lance who has the ability to run and do all these different things, I'm more excited to see how D'Amico Ryans is going to deploy this defense than I am to watch Kyle Shanahan and what he's going to do with that offense. And that's like, like I find myself shocked that I'm saying that, but I truly do feel that way based on how they've been deploying them through these walkthroughs and through some of these 11 on 11s. Um, there's one play I will highlight because it was at uh, practice in front of 20,000 people. So it's not some secret. They had a play <laughs> the other day uh, that was a rep with the first team uh, where the 49ers uh, offense was, I'm trying to remember. I think they were, um, I think Jimmy was under center, but it was like a five-step drop where he was trying to get the ball over the middle. And what the defense did was they rotated coverage at the last second. So they had Jimmy Ward come over. Raheem Mostert was out in the slot, uh, and he had Flanagan fouls opposite him. They had Jimmy Ward rotate at the last second after Garoppolo had done his pre-snap read and come over behind Flanagan fouls. So Jimmy Ward ended up covering Mostert one-on-one, -on -one, which, again, we talked about Jimmy Ward earlier. The fact that he was able to keep up and man coverage with the guy as fast as Raheem Mostert is just like mind boggling to me. And then ultimately what happened was Flanagan fouls ended up rushing. So the offensive line um, was expecting Willis to be the guy on the edge um, rushing. And you want to maintain the closest guy inside when you're that right tackle out there. You can't let guys beat you to the interior. So Mike McGlinchey ends up picking up Flanagan Fowles, who was a guy I don't think the offensive line or the quarterback in Garoppolo expected to be rushing. It looked like his responsibility was going to either be in zone coverage or sticking with Mostert. And then Willis ended up running free. And because they had um, run, ran that to the right side, on the left side where uh, Trent Williams and George Kittle were, they had uh, Kittle there to block as well. Trent Williams ended up blocking nobody. And I have a – I think I put a video of this up. If you um, – yeah, you see, did. you know, my ad will be on the screen. If you go to my Twitter, you can see it there because I'm sorry. I know it's hard to visualize, but effectively what they did was they had a guy rushing at Jimmy Garoppolo freely, untouched, literally not blocked at all, not even close to being touched by an offensive lineman, while also having Trent Williams, who I think is the 49ers best player, left with nobody to block. He was literally there blocking grass, kind of like, like looking around. <laughs> literally useless. So they literally negated the best player on the offensive line while also having a guy on the opposite side rush freely at Jimmy Garoppolo. And I thought that that play really magnified how creative um, Ryan's is getting and some of the stuff he's going to be doing with that uh, coverage rotation, blitzing different guys, showing different looks. 
And again, if you make Trent Williams, if you throw such a curveball at Trent Williams that he's left just standing in front of grass with nobody to block, I think you need to chalk that up as a huge win. And I'm sure when they went through and they looked at that in the film room after the defense had, you know, they were patting themselves on the back a little bit because you don't see stuff like that happen very often. So when I saw that, um, I saw it happen live and I made a note of it and I went back and watched the film of that practice after. I was like, oh boy, this is going to be a really fun season. Yeah, that sounds pretty exotic, Jordan. Sounds like an exotic play. But I'm going to have to agree with you. I think when we heard that Salah was going to be on his way out, um, you know, he was interviewing for head coaching positions. And as soon as we heard that D'Amico Ryans was taking over, I mean, I know on this podcast, that was one of the first things we talked about is what is this new defense going to look like? And it sounds like it's going to look pretty damn good. Um, that being said, the 49ers had a top five defense in 2019. Obviously, 2020 was riddled with injuries. How do you think this 2021 defense is going to stack up against that 2019 defense we saw that was just um, so powerful in the NFL? So that's where it gets really interesting because the Niners have had a top five defense two years in a row, and you rarely, if ever, see a defense stay top five three years in a row. Even some of the best defenses of all time, um, generally after that third se- entering that third season, you're going to start to regress a little bit. Defense more than offense regresses over time. Offense is a little bit more consistent where there's so many variables on defense that it's much harder to maintain that kind of top five consistency. So it's like I, I love statistics and I love having objective numbers to look at. But I also think that there would not it would not surprise me in the slightest if I just based on the eye test thought that this defense looked better than either of those two while also finishing maybe like 8th or 10th or something like that. Like they may not finish it with the same um, ranking in total defense or points allowed, but I could still see a path to them looking much better. Um, an example I'd cite is, you know, that 49ers defense in 2019, you know, they gave up 40-plus to the Saints. They gave up uh, – I, I forgot how much I think they gave up – playing on, sorry. I know that Falcons game wasn't their best game either. They had some injuries. They had games where they they just they got beat by the opposing offense and it wasn't pretty. It didn't look good, but they also had games where they just completely shut teams down. And I think that that's what you'll see from this group this year. They might have a couple games where they don't look great. But they're going to have so many games that they do look really good. And when you add in the exotic looks, you add in the different coverage looks they're giving. I think that uh, there's a very realistic path to where I think that this might be the best of those three defenses. It just won't reflect that statistically, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you said they were top five last year, too. They were, yeah. Is actually terrifying to consider. (laughs) (laughs) Because injuries. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) That's, yeah, that's pretty insane. Um, So obviously, this, this episode was very defense heavy. But we cannot have you here, Jordan, without asking you about the quote unquote quarterback competition and uh, what you've seen. Um, I'll start just by asking, is there a competition in your eyes? So, yeah, I think there's a competition at every position in every training camp. Some guys are just so good that you're never going to hear about a competition because there's no way that they're going to lose their job based on how well they play. Uh, I don't think that's the situation with the quarterback situation this year. I think that it is a very open competition. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo obviously has the upper hand as the incumbent starter and the veteran. Uh, and I also would add that I think that he has played well enough that he, he's definitely earned the right to have it be his job to lose rather than, you know, they're both starting on even footing. Um, but you know, real quickly, just objectively watching these two play Trey Lance is the much more physically talented player. He's bigger, he's faster, he's stronger. He has a stronger arm. Uh, He can run with the ball. You can incorporate a lot of design runs with him. So realistically, it's not as a matter of like, you know, who's the better player, because I think that Trey Lance really just is the better talent. It's more so who's going to operate with better timing within the offense, who's going to command the huddle better, who's going to understand what defenses are throwing at them and all these different things. Uh, So right now, I think that, Jimmy Garoppolo is still maintaining his, you know, starting spot. I haven't seen enough. um, I've seen a lot of very impressive things from Trey Lance, but I haven't seen enough consistently strung together to where I would say, yeah, he's going to start week one. You know, this is Jimmy's Jimmy's battle that he lost. And I think that that's something that really does need nuance because, you know, um, I've had people say, well, oh, you said Trey Lance is more talented. Just because he's more talented doesn't mean that he's going to immediately be given that job. And, you know, like I would point out, well, he also is having a second team offensive line block in front of him. And that needs to be accounted for as well. He is going up against a second team defense. And I don't think that the 
uh, the exotic looks and some of the different coverages and late safety rotations and all the things you're going to see at the NFL level. Uh, he's not really being put to the full test yet. And that's one thing that, you know, as much as talented as he is, you have to account for all these little things that you're going to have to do as an NFL quarterback. Um, I think that Jimmy had, you know, a few practices that were so-so. They weren't terrible. They weren't great. Yesterday was by far his best practice of the year. If he plays like he did yesterday, there's no reason for him to lose his starting job anytime soon. Um, I would just also add that it was without pads and it was with a good portion of the first team defense missing. But for me, it was more so his willingness to take chances. It wasn't that he was, you know, just carving up a second team defense. It was that he was much more willing to be aggressive and confident. And that's the biggest dif- uh, difference between the two of them is that from the jump, Lance has been more willing to take shots downfield. He's been more willing to throw into tighter windows. He has better vo- uh, velocity on the ball, two fit balls in the tighter windows. And I wonder if that's something that they've discussed in the locker room or in meetings uh, because at the, the more and more we saw that from Trey Lance, you're starting to see it more from Jimmy too, where he is trying to fire balls into tight windows and he is trying to throw into coverage a little bit more frequently. Um, so realistically, it comes down to a couple things for me. Um, I think that the biggest difference between the two of them is that they both aren't they're, – they're, they're missing throws at a higher rate than you'd like to see from the starting quarterback. The biggest difference is that Trey Lance misses high and away and it's generally outside the numbers. So what that means is that when he misses, for the most part, it means that either the receiver is going to get it or nobody's getting it. Uh, whereas with Garoppolo, he tends to miss behind a lot and he tends to miss low. And what that means is that generally the trailing defender is going to be able to make a play on the ball. There was a lot of reps during practice where a uh, receiver would have a step on the DB, but because the throw was behind, they either had a chance to make a play on it, tip the ball up, uh, intercept it. Um, so that is very concerning as well. The other thing I would just add, is that the ball just comes out of Trey Lance's hands differently. And that's not a knock on Jimmy Garoppolo. Trey Lance is just an exceptionally gifted player. And I think that that's why the 49ers felt comfortable moving the amount of draft capital they did for the chance to draft him. The ball just jumps out of his hands. That's the word I keep using is jumps. Cause it literally just, it pops. When you see this guy step into some of these throws, um, the velocity that he's putting on them. Uh, I haven't seen the 49ers quarterback put that much, um, you know, heat behind the ball since Colin Kaepernick. And I think that that lends itself to give you the opportunity to take more chances downfield, two fit balls in the tighter windows, two hit guys that maybe Garoppolo won't feel as comfortable throwing to. But he still does have a learning curve. He still is missing a lot of receivers high. He still is working on his time with his, uh, with his receivers. He is late on a lot of throws as well. So just to summarize, I think that Trey Lance has all the talents that you want out of a starting quarterback. He has all of the intangibles and the uh, leadership qualities you look for in the face of the franchise. I just think that he still has some minor adjustments to go through. Um, And generally, the uh, biggest thing that guys have a problem with the rookie season is adapting to the playbook, commanding the huddle, knowing the pre-snap cadence and all these things. Uh, By all accounts, he's been great at that. It's more so just cleaning up the timing with his receivers and then limiting um, missing guys high the way he has. So as of now, if you had, if you asked me to pick one or the other who would be starting right away, I would say Garoppolo is still held on to that spot firmly. But over the next couple of weeks, if Lance starts to clean up that timing with his receivers, which is natural to expect over time, again, he is a 21-year-old rookie. We have to remind ourselves that no matter how talented he is, there is going to be a learning curve for a guy that's that young that hasn't had NFL experience. Um, so if he's able to clean up the accuracy issues a little bit and get a little bit better with his timing, Um, I just don't see a way how you can't put him out there on the field. Because the one thing I would add to is the explosive plays with Lance have been way more frequent than they have been with Garoppolo. And that's because he has the ability to buy time with his legs, extend plays. Defenses have to respect the fact that he can take off running on them. They've run a lot of zone read where he can either hand off to the uh, running back beside him or he can keep. They've run triple option stuff. Uh, They've been deploying wide receivers with this triple option. The, The creativeness and the ceiling of the offense is so much higher with Lance that I think they just need to get to a point where Shanahan really feels comfortable that he is ready to do it because you can start with Garoppolo and transition to Lance. And that's kind of natural and expected. It can organically happen. If you start with Lance and he struggles and you go back to Garoppolo, all of a sudden you're in a position where things get really dicey. And even though you put all that capital to Lance and clear the guy long-term, you don't want a situation similar to what Miami had last season where they were going back and forth between the veteran and Fitzpatrick and the rookie with Tua because it's going to um, cause problems, I believe, in the locker room, and it's also going to stunt the growth of the rookie as well. 
So I think that the 49ers are in a spot where if Garoppolo can just limit the turnovers, he can execute the offense, and they're not um, in a position where defenses are just taking away everything in the short game and daring him to, to win deep, and like kind of what we saw in a few games last year, he will be more than fine because ultimately what we have to remember is this roster 1-53 through 53 is so talented and so good that they are a team that could very reasonably win the Super Bowl this season, at the very least compete for a deep playoff run. And I don't think you want to get stuck into a position where you're flip-flopping quarterbacks, losing the locker room, having you know a divided locker room, and all those things that go into – constantly going back and forth between two different guys. So I think that Garoppolo will ultimately start the season and then uh, barring, uh, you know, injury, it will just ultimately come down to if he has a couple of the games, like if he plays like he did week one against Arizona last year, I wouldn't be surprised if Lance starts week two. I don't think that he's going to have a very long leash whatsoever, but it's going to be his job to lose to start the season. Yeah. And we know what, what Jimmy G is capable of. And for the people that might be upset to hear that, that might be upset to hear that, you know, He's probably going to start week one. There are worse things in the world than having Jimmy Garoppolo, who's been to the Super Bowl as your bridge quarterback to your future franchise quarterback. You know, it could be a lot worse. We could be the Dolphins. So (laughs) (laughs) that being said, um, we want to hop into the Twitter tizzy. And uh, Steph, I'm going to kind of let you explain what the lowdown on Twitter has been this past week. Yeah, well... First, I want to say, Jordan, I I appreciate you being very objective in, you know, your talk about both Jimmy and Trey Lance. And and that's one thing I've noticed um, in your training camp tweets. And that's why I've enjoyed your coverage so much. Um, But I think it's also, you know, people are seeing different reporters reporting you know, maybe one side of the story a little more than the other. And it's kind of causing this, you know, divide between fans and even some beat writers, um, you know, as far as, you know, what's the full story. And and I wanted to get your thoughts on that, whether you feel like one is more right than the other, or maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. What do you think? I think that there hasn't been any actual um... – you know, like lying or non-factual reporting going on. You know, the 49ers, one, uh, you know, as great as the players are and the fans are, the people who cover the team are really great as well. There are a lot of very talented, very good people who are covering the team. I think the main difference is just the context that gets left out of some things. A uh, perfect example, the last throw of practice for Trey Lance on the uh, Dwight Clark day was a ball that he rifled in uh, over the middle to Elijah Mitchell. Uh, put it right on his hands. The ball literally went right through his hands. He had his hands like this. The ball went right through, got tipped up, and it got intercepted by, uh, I think it was, Mar- I could have been wrong. I believe it was Marcel Harris. Um, but yeah, it was an interception. And I saw a couple of tweets that were like, oh, Trey Lance's final throw of the day was an interception uh, on a ball, like, uh, you know, intended for Elijah Mitchell. Or you know, it, it wasn't clearly stated that the ball was literally put in the exact place it needed to be. It was a perfect throw that didn't need to be, you know, um, it should have been caught. It didn't. It didn't have any business being tipped in the air. And you know, there was there's some some stuff with like the zone read keeps with Lance that I've seen where it's oh Trey Lance that fumbled a ball and it was it was him putting the ball in the stomach of a running back and the running back not cleanly fielding it. Um, I've also seen some things on the flip side uh, where Jimmy's stuff is being downplayed where it's oh he only looks good because he's throwing the ball short. Well, you know what? If they're calling plays and they're having guys just running shallow drag routes or they're running shallow crossing routes or little out routes to the flat and he's getting the ball there, and the, the offense is moving the chains. It doesn't really matter how it happens. So I just think ultimately the lack of context is really tough, and that's one thing I'm very blessed to have been able to be there to see a lot of this in person because I'm seeing now the, the Twitter stuff you're mentioning. I'm sitting there, and I'm reading some of this stuff, and I'm like, I just saw this with my own eyes. This isn't, this isn't you know the full story. Um, and I empathize with people who aren't able to be there for every practice because it's got to be very hard to keep up with all this um, – stuff going on when you don't know who to trust or who to be reliable. And I don't want to sit here and, you know, make this about me, but I will promise that I will try to be as objective as possible. Um, If you go back and you look at my Twitter or any of the stuff I've written for Niners nation, uh, you know, I, I, and all my articles talking about the quarterback specifically, I try to add a good thing that they did and a bad thing they did from practice. And I try to be fair for both. Uh, Jimmy Garo- I, I said yesterday, I thought Jimmy Garoppolo was the best player on the field because I truly felt that way. Wednesday, I thought Lance was clearly the best player on the field. Um, I've also pointed out some bad things that each have done, and I will try to do my best to be as objective as possible because ultimately I think that's what the fans deserve. They deserve unbiased, objective reporting. Um, I also think that it's fair to acknowledge that uh, in this day and age in media, 
uh, clicks and, and views and likes and all those things are what are going to drive traffic. And that's ultimately what's paying the bills for a lot of these guys. So uh, I know people get upset at headlines sometimes, but ultimately just understand that there's a reason why a lot of these guys do what they do. The 49ers uh, media team, the people who cover the 49ers are very good at what they do. A lot of these guys have been around uh, guys, guys and gals, the women covering the team are fantastic too. But a lot of these uh, reporters have been around for a long time and they really know what they're doing. Um, so I just think the best thing that you can do is find a source that you really trust, uh, find somebody that you believe is going to be fair and, uh, and objective with their reporting and kind of stick to them and ignore the outside noise. Because I've seen different, like, um, I'm not charting passes every day. I did the first couple days, but it's, it's so hard. I'm trying to focus on specific players and specific things. So I just rely, there's going to be somebody charting the throwing numbers, but I'm seeing now each day there's, you know, three different uh, stat lines for a quarterback in training camp. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Like one of these is way off from the other one. So you ultimately have to find a source that you trust. And again, I'm not here to plug anybody or say any names or anything. It's ultimately whatever you feel subjectively is going to make you the most comfortable as a consumer of this content. But just understand that um, if everybody just objectively reported the same thing over and over again, it would get very boring very fast. And a lot of these, this, a lot of the modern journalism wouldn't exist. So you kind of do have to drum up a little bit of controversy if you want to continue to drive interest to what you're doing. And that's just unfortunately the way sports media as a whole has gone. So I just think that people need to understand that there's kind of a method to the madness is basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I mean, you have to take everything you see on Twitter with a grain of salt because also, you know, there's only a certain amount of characters that these reporters can utilize to say what happened during practice. So that would be some of my advice as well is to if you have, you know, someone that you like and you enjoy following their coverage, um, support their work and read what they're writing as well, not just their tweets, um, because that way you can usually get a lot more context and usually a lot of the time it's not intentional on the part of the tweeter. You know, there's just only so much you can say. So uh, that would, that would just be like my two cents on it. I don't know. <laughs> also, I cover high school football and I take my own stats and you would be surprised at how often the stats keepers for high school football are padding stats. Like it's pretty <laughs> insane. So I could see how uh, someone out at training camp that wants one person to succeed more than the other might just, you know, tack on a, a couple receptions or complete passes, you know, um, not saying they do, but that's just, well, yeah. I mean, we're all human beings, right? So I'm not, yeah. gonna, you know, if, if I have a strong opinion about a player and there's an avenue to um, highlight something that they did really good during practice, I'm certainly going to do so because it's going to make my um, voice more credible. It's going to make my opinion um, have a little bit more weight in the public eye and, you know, in my opinion, but I'm also, I personally am not going to fabricate things to do that. And unfortunately, um, at times, I don't think that that's, you know, just like you said, it's, it's prevalent in high school sports, college sports, pro sports. There's going to be people that are going to get so caught up in proving that they are right or proving that what they say is true, that they end up actually fabricating things. And that's where, again, I'll say during this training camp, I haven't seen anything that's an objective uh lie where you can sit there and be like that's not true but you know like i have seen um a few things like uh, you know I, I i don't want to get into specifics but i'll give you an example i saw uh, an example of somebody saying that a certain player had been really good during all of training camp and they had a couple of really good practices lately totally fair that's totally um my subjective opinion and i think objectively most people would agree but i'm sitting there going through and especially going back just to double check through my notes and I and many others I trust definitely wouldn't have said that that person was having a great practice. So, again, it kind of depends. Some people may just see things differently. Um, so when you're taking opinions, just like uh, Angie said, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And the character thing on Twitter is just irritates me because there's so many times where I want to say something and I cannot fit the entire point. And the thing is with Twitter, it's just like anything else in the modern world. People's attention spans are very short. So if you make a thread of things, generally people are only going to read that first tweet. And it's very hard to add the needed context within 180 characters or whatever it is. So I would just say that ultimately um, don't read too much into training camp stats. And if you start to find, because I'm sure we're all aware, there's a couple of prevalent you know, beat writers who seem to have this rivalry going. Um, just whoever side you decide to fall on, stick to that and don't get caught up in the back and forth just because ultimately – it's not going to do you any good as a fan if you're seeking information. And I just think that again, it's, it's a matter of what people want to consume. And there's some people 
I myself, I'm not above being entertained by back and forth and exchanges on Twitter. It's it's a low. It's not. I don't say it's a low time. It's an exciting time for football. But the regular season hasn't started yet. There's some people that are going to get more joy out of watching two beat writers go at it than they will reading actual training camp stats. So I think that kind of fuels it as well. The drama side of it, where you know it's still bringing eyes to the work they're doing. So I don't think that they're going to shy away from anything that might add to that. So again, it's all a matter of personal personal preference at the end of the day. If you get sick of seeing beat writers argue with each other, you get sick of seeing misinformation. The mute button on Twitter is your friend. I used to not utilize it as much. Ever since I have, my life has been much more peaceful. So I would recommend ignore things you don't like, find things you do like, and then stick with the reports that you find are the most consistent and the ones that are going to make you feel comfortable as a fan consuming the content. Absolutely. Well, Jordan, uh, we appreciate your objective input with us today, and we couldn't thank you enough for coming on. Um, next week, we are going to have Brad Graham of the SF Niners. I know you gave him a shout out earlier, so we're super excited to talk to him um, about what he's seen from the offense and the offensive line uh, during training camp. So, Jordan, we thank you. Uh, this is the 49 Carats podcast. You can find us on Twitter at 49K Pod, and we are streaming on all sites where you can stream podcasts so check us out Steph anything you want to add to sign off I just wanted to give Jordan a shout out guys make sure you follow Jordan uh, Splash Cousin on Twitter and also read his articles he's got great stuff and as we've been mentioning he's very objective so yeah awesome for being we on. will yes thank you Jordan and we will see you guys next week thanks for tuning in peace <laughs>